humidity and houseplants. Two words and things that go together like peanut butter and jelly, ham and cheese, salt and pepper, yet these words can bring stress to the people who choose to care for humidity and loving houseplants and live in an area that experiences winter or just has forced heat or air conditioning. Over my seven years of collecting houseplants, I have thought about humidity so much and I've often asked the question, do I really need a humidifier? Why is humidity so important? How do I measure humidity in my house? Do I really need to care about it? Well. Don't worry, plant friend, the answers to all these questions and more, including a plant nerd deep dive with our favorite plant nerd, Leslie Halleck, will be in today's episode. So get ready. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy. Hello, hello, my beautiful plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. I know I have, as per usual. If you're new here, I'm Maria. I'm your new best plant friend. I'm here to help you care for plants successfully and grow joy in your life. If you're not new here and you're coming back to the podcast and you've been a repeat listener, thank you so much for showing up to the show on a weekly basis. It means the world to me. I feel so honored to be part of your planty journey. Today, we have a continuation of a mini series on the show called Grow Better with my best plant friend and plant nerd horticulturist and author, Leslie Halleck. She is amazing. I hope you have listened to our other episodes on the show with her that we've recently done a deep dive on houseplant pests, a deep dive on houseplant issues, houseplant disease. We've done some really amazing episodes lately. But this mini series, because she's a horticulturist, is all rooted in growing better and empowering the community with the plant science knowledge to really understand why we do the things that we do when it comes to caring for houseplants. And she's the best. I just love talking to her and I use this as an excuse to (laughs) talk to her more. So today we're diving deep on all things humidity when it comes to houseplants. It's one of the most important aspects of plant care that either gets overlooked or gets misunderstood. So today, Leslie, as the amazing horticulturist, plant science expert that she is, breaks everything down in really digestible ways. So even someone like me, who's like a total bonehead when it comes to science, will understand. We cover a lot of ground on today's episode, so let's dive right in. Here's Leslie. Leslie, my grow better friend, welcome back. Hi, we're actually doing some video today. I know. So plant friends, tune in to uh, our Instagrams, Growing Joy with Maria for little clips to see all the fun stuff Leslie brought in to talk about. But I'm so excited to have you to do this deep dive in in humidity today, Leslie, because uh, I mean, you and I have (laughs) talked so much offline (laughs) about humidity and how like misleading so much stuff about humidity is on the internet and how like everybody talks about pebble trays and spritzing leaves. And it makes me so sad when I see blogs that basically like set people up for failure online. And when I took your class at UCLA, and when you gave Garden Society lectures on like the deep dive of why humidity is so important and indoor humidity specifically, it blew my mind. So I'm so excited that you've agreed to come chat with me today. Well, sure. And I think obviously this time of year, humidity can be particularly challenging. And most of the plants we're growing as indoor plants are tropicals that are you know, native or endemic to climates um, and environments with naturally high humidity levels. And obviously outside air is typically much more humid than inside air. And we'll talk about why. So it's a timely topic that is one that causes a lot of consternation amongst plant parents everywhere. And I think especially with the rise of popularity of a lot of specialty aeroids and thuriums, you know, as an example, which all fall into what I call the humidity diva category. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, caused a lot of frustration and people have had to develop a lot of workarounds. And you're right, there's a lot of regurgitated information online. And I get why a lot of the poor advice is out there and gets propagated so frequently, because you know, you look up something online, and you see a blog post, and you just assume it's correct. 
And you assume that you can not only use this information and reshare it. So I just see a lot of regurgitation of the same advice when it comes to humidity with plants indoors. But unfortunately, most of it is pretty ineffectual ineffectual and, and can be problematic, actually. And that's this Grow Better series, right? It's like, how can we do this better? How can we understand this better? And I think in order to do that, you have to have a basic understanding of humidity and why it's so important to plants. So you started talking about how so many house plants are actually, you know, at the bottom of the rainforest in the jungle where the humidity is 90%. What do we need to know in terms of humidity and house plants before we even get into the indoor and outdoor aspects of it? Like why is humidity so important and, and how does it affect the plant? Well, yeah, I can spend hours and hours, as you well know, um, talking about this topic because this it's a lot of science. But, you know, let's just talk about tropicals to start out with. Obviously, many of our tropical houseplants are native to areas with both a lot of natural ambient humidity and a lot of moisture at the ground level. So you have a lot of plants that are adapted to growing epiphytically with exposed roots because there's plenty of moisture, right? They, through natural selection and evolution, have adapted to those environments to be able to harvest water from the air, right? When you have a lot of water in the air. Humidity or lack thereof, and I'm going to get a little bit more specific about this in a minute, is responsible for a lot of things. But importantly, when we're talking about potted house plants um, and garden plants, transpiration, which is the movement of water from the soil into the root zone, up and out of the plant through transpo evaporation, um, is driven. That last part of moving water up and out of a plant is driven by transpiration. And that is dependent on the amount of humidity that's, that's in the air or lack thereof. There's a lot of other biological factors that go into that. But you know, when your plants dry out and wilt and lose turgidity, you know, it could be both because um, they've lost too much water through transpiration or not enough water is actually moving up and out of the plant to maintain tur- turgidity. So transpiration is really responsible for a lot of important biological functions. It moves water and nutrients up and through the plant and then out. And so that constant movement keeps your plant turgid and upright, as well as moving nutrients around and taking up your fertilizer. So there's a lot of important reasons why you need water to move up and out of your plant through the stomata, those little pores, you know, that are in in the leaves under under the leaf surface and on top. So your humidity levels, and you're going to hear me talk about relative humidity, relative humidity, the amount of humidity that's in the air is always relative to the temperature because air temperature changes things. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. So yeah, I mean, you know, when you're talking about overwatering or underwatering, your humidity, the relative humidity in your space has a lot to do with whether that water is moving up and out of the plant fast enough, or it's sitting too long at the root zone. So over and under watering can also be an effect of humidity levels. Because transpiration, which is affected by the humidity levels outside, transpiration has a lot to do with the overwatering and underwatering because transpiration is how that plant is pulling the water up and through the plant, right? Correct. So Correct. this this relationship between transpiration and humidity is really because it's transpiration that is really keeping that plant turgid and healthy and moving waters and nutrients through the plant. And so when the humidity, which affects transpiration greatly, which we'll chat about in a minute, when the humidity is off, the transpiration is going to be off, the plant is going to be off. I am currently staring, you know, with my partnership with Proven Winners this year, I've been trying lots of humidity divas, (laughs) like you've talked about. So I have a bunch of new alocasia in my collection. I have a bunch of new calathea in my collection. Oh my God. And for the most part, Leslie, I'm doing very good, nice. but I have one humidity diva, okay. the Calathea yes. Picturata. Yes. I don't, uh, I'll, I'll double check and I'll leave her name in the show notes, but it's so funny how she's such a freaking diva. If I don't water her, if I miss 12 hours of her watering schedule, if she isn't in the center of all, you know, of all the plants, like she is so high maintenance. Over the Calathea orbifolia, my Calathea orbifolia is going mm-hmm. great. My Alocasia stingray, so happy, thriving. But this freaking one Calathea is giving me so much guff. And I know it's a humidity and watering thing. I just, and that's on me to adjust to her. Like I just, I haven't had a plant this high maintenance before, but it's been very interesting. And that's going to change seasonally too. So right now, totally. 
let's dig into this a little bit further here in a minute, but it's winter, so you're running a heater, right? So I suspect the same humidity diva is going to be less of a struggle for you in summer when you're running your air conditioning or it's just cooler in your house. And, and we'll explain why. We, we're going to get into a little topic called VPD or vapor pressure deficit because that's really what drives transpiration. Humidity, relative humidity isn't, isn't really the determining factor. It's part of it. But yeah, so seasonal changes will change. You know, light chain, light quantity will change all of the speed of all of those processes in your plants. So yeah, it's all about learning the environment and, and also remember, and you know that I will always tell you this, you have to get to know every species a little bit differently because genetically each species is programmed to have its own ideal balance of light, humidity, water moisture, a percentage of oxygen around the root zone, the rhizosphere. So you really can't treat every plant exactly the same in the same environment and expect similar results from every species of plant because every species has conditions under which it's programmed to thrive or not, right? Oh boy, am I learning that. <laughs> Even amongst the same genus. So just because you have different anthurium species in that genus, you're going to find that some species are more tolerant to lower relative humidity levels or, or a higher vapor pressure deficit, or conversely, others in the same genus may not be. So you can have similarities generally, but oftentimes those differences really manifest at the species level very differently from one another. So you have to get to know each species and you may have some anthuriums that, or calatheas that you can get away with having out on an open window still just fine and other species in the same genus that you realize, boy, this just isn't going to work for this plant. You know, my house is just too dry. I've got to go under glass or find another strategy, right? Yes. Okay. Sweet plant friend listeners, this is the portion where we're going to dive into some plant science. We're going to get nerdy. Bear with us as we chunk through some very scientific terms because it's going to help you understand so much more when we then go into how to manage humidity in your home. All the practical tips we're going to talk to, hang in there with us as we dive into some plant science terms because I took Leslie's course at UCLA a couple of years ago, when I learned about this, it really blew my mind. And I feel like it's really going to empower you to understand humidity on a much deeper level. So with that, Leslie, <laughs> with that disclaimer, <laughs> you have talked about multiple fancy names, relative humidity. I'm about to say VPN, but it's not VPN. VPD, vapor pressure deficit. Vapor pressure deficit. Yeah. So can you go into these terms and why we should be understanding them? And then we can kind of go into how they apply to us in the winter and the summer. Yes. I'm going to try to really make this science bite-sized and digestible for all of you. I'm really going to simplify it. So if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of really understanding this, like maybe you want to do more advanced environmental controls or, you know, grow tents, or you really want to get serious about a collection, or maybe you're doing interior scaping or have a reason and you want to dig into it. Yes, you can take my indoor plants and maintenance course through UCLA Extension. And I'll go into <laughs> all the nitty gritty there. But for our purposes here, there's three terms that I want to say to you. Relative humidity, which I've mentioned, which you'll see abbreviated as RH, and that's basically the amount of absolute humidity that's in the air at a specific temperature. Absolute humidity is literally the volume of water vapor droplets that are in a given amount of air, and we, and we do that in cubic meters. Okay, and then what's really relevant to what drives transpiration in your plant or water loss through the leaves, if that's an easier way to remember that is vapor pressure deficit. So if you want to get a little technical or you want to grow in a greenhouse, this is a term you need to understand because getting beyond relative humidity, it's understanding really what is the air missing? How much water vapor is missing from the air? The more water vapor that's missing from the same amount of air means you're going to lose more water from your plant faster. Vapor pressure deficit. How much water vapor is missing from your air? The more water vapor that's missing from your air in a given space, the faster your plant is going to lose moisture through evapotranspiration. All right, plant friends, January brings its set of challenges, which we've talked about today in the episode for our leafy companions with shorter and colder days. 
But with Soltex Grow Lights, the Aspect, the Vita, the Highland, and the Grove, your indoor garden can thrive like never before, no matter what your home setup looks like and what the outdoor lighting situation is. All of Soltex Grow Lights have that full spectrum white light that mimics the sun to keep your plants healthy. Then, depending on what your home setup is, you can choose which type of lighting offering that they have. So their first and kind of flagship product is the Aspect Pendant Light. It's a sleek pendant light you hang from the ceiling. It's incredible. I think I have three of them. One hangs in my closet in my office right now. They're perfect for hanging above your favorite fern or monstera, and they just look like a sleek modern light fixture you'd see anywhere. Then the most versatile option that they have is the Vita. It's their grow bulb that fits into any lamp. Any floor lamp or desk lamp that you have, you can literally just screw the Vita into it and turn that lamp into a grow lamp. And for tech enthusiasts, the Vita is compatible with smart systems. For the ambitious plant enthusiast that is maybe growing a green wall or maybe has an office or maybe wants to light plants high up, the Highland track lighting system is the answer to your prayers. And my new favorite toy, which I just installed in my office, in my office bookshelf is called their Grove. It's a dimmable and adjustable grow bar. It is so awesome. I've used many different grow bars before. This is a super awesome one. I installed it in my bookshelf to turn a shelf and my bookcase. I installed it in my bookcase to turn one of my bookshelves into a highlight haven for all my plants. You can put it under kitchen cabinets. You can mount it in an Ikea grow shelf, grow frame thing, or you can install them in tight spaces but they're amazing. <laughs> so as winter approaches, if you need grow lights, you should definitely check out Soltech and you get 15% off for being a Growing Joy listener. So the way you're going to do that is go to soltech.com and use code BLOOM15, BLOOM15 for 15% off your purchase. Make every day brighter one plant at a time. And don't forget that Soltech offers free shipping in the US and a multi-year warranty. So head to soltech.com and use code BLOOM15, BLOOM15 at checkout. That's Zoltech.com and code Bloom15 at checkout. So let's talk about cold air and warm air. Yeah. Because this is where this really comes into play. So cold air is able to hold less absolute water vapor than warm air. Warm air can hold a lot more water vapor than cold air. So let's say you have a room that's eight by 10. We have two rooms that are identical and they're the exact same space and have this exact same furniture and everything in it. So what you're left with is the exact amount of air volume in cubic meters in both rooms, right? And we're both at sea level. Everything is equivalent, right? Air pressure is the same. And one room is 60 degrees and the other room is 85 degrees. And we take one bucket Say there's no water vapor in those rooms. We take a one bucket of water and we put one bucket of water in each room and that's going to evaporate into that room. Which room do you think is going to empty the bucket faster through evaporation? Me? Yes, you. Okay. <laughs> Which room is going to, I think intuitively, I would assume that the hotter room would evaporate faster because you think that water needs heat to evaporate. Well, it's actually the vapor pressure deficit. The warm right. air in that room has the capacity to hold more water vapor. So it is going and, and, and temperature speeds up those physical processes as well. So yes. Now, let's say you've got your room at 60 degrees and your room at 85 degrees, and you now have a bucket worth of water vapor that has, that's in the air now as humidity. As, mm -hmm. as humidity in each of those spaces. And you put a plant, the same plant, in each of those rooms. Which plant is going to lose more water faster, is going to dry out faster? Even though you have the same absolute humidity, meaning the same quantity of water vapor in the air in both rooms, but one is 60 degrees and one is 85, which plant's going to dry out faster? So let me talk through this for a minute because yes. the 85 degree room, yes. you said has can hold more capacity for evaporation, right? Correct. Yes. And then the 60 degree room can hold less capacity for evaporation because Correct. it's colder. Correct. And I have the same plant in both rooms. Yes. And so did you say which plant is going to transpire faster? Correct. Which one's going to dry out faster? You got this. Is it going to be the cold one because it wants to transpire? No. no, it's the hot one. Okay. And this is why I take you through this sort of mental exercise because it's counterintuitive. 
it's a little bit difficult to grasp this concept first. The warmer room with the same amount of water vapor in it as the room with 60 degrees still has a larger vapor pressure deficit. It can still hold more water vapor than the room at the colder temperature. That means the deficit is bigger. You have to think about it backwards. More is still missing. The capacity is greater to put more. So that room at 85 degrees, let's say, could hold five buckets worth of water vapor, whereas the room at 60 degrees could only hold two buckets worth of water vapor. Same space. So if essentially you think about it in the colder space, that air is fuller of water vapor already than the Mm -hmm. warm room, then transpiration is going to do what? It's going to be slower. That water loss is going to be slower in the cold room versus the warm room. I just wanted to ask one question. So the hygrometer that I have on my desk, that percentage, 35% humidity that it's telling me my office is, what is that? Is that relative humidity? Correct. Your hygrometer, which is a great tool, that does not give you vapor pressure deficit. If you wanted to learn how to calculate that, you can take my class if you really want to do Mm -hmm. some math. (laughs) But the little hygrometer does give you the relative humidity because it's always relative to temperature. So what it's telling you is that whatever temperature your room is, that's the relative humidity, which is still going to be most it's going to be useful for most of you houseplant keepers to know that because most of your tropical houseplants are going to be happy at a relative humidity of around 60 to 80 percent. That's going to be what's ideal. Many of them will tolerate 40 to 50 percent, which is where most of our houses will hover around 40 percent relative humidity to whatever temperature is in the room. Just Remember that 40% relative humidity at 80 degrees and 40% relative humidity at 60 degrees are two different things to your plants. At 40% relative humidity in an 80 degree room, your plant's going to dry out faster than it will at 40% relative humidity at 60 degrees. That's where understanding vapor pressure deficit really makes this click of understanding how to use relative humidity at different temperatures which is really changes for you seasonally and why you are going to struggle when you kick those heaters on in winter, you're going to dry out your air significantly more because when it's warmer, it can hold more. So your deficit's greater. So you may struggle more with plants drying out in the winter than you do in the summer inside your house, which is like opposite of what you would think, right? Yeah. So counterintuitive. So let's dive into that. So Winter is, I feel like, when so many people are talking about humidity in houseplants. So obviously, this has to do with what you were just talking about. Can you dive in a little bit more and talk about why it is so much drier in in the winter? Yeah. And and again, this is, we're speaking about climates that might not be sort of arid or naturally really, really dry outside. So for most of us, you know, we have, you know, some natural humidity levels outdoors in the winter. Well, we most of we have HVAC systems in our house, right? So many of us are running air conditioning units during the warmer months, and then we're kicking on a furnace, a heater, you know, system in the winter. Both of those types of cooling and heating units pull moisture out of our air. So air conditioners, um, evaporative coolers will pull moisture out of your indoor air to cool it. So that lowers your relative humidity. Heaters will use up moisture by running air past heating coils and that burns off moisture. So you lose moisture, you lose humidity in your air. The challenge with winter is that it, because you're running heaters constantly, you're heating up your space more in the winter than you would be in summer. And what does that do to the vapor pressure deficit? It increases it because your temperature is warmer in your space. You're running a heater. So yeah, you can have 40% relative humidity in your office in July if you're running an air conditioner and it's 78 degrees. And then in winter, you're kicking on that heater and maybe close to those heater vents, you know, it might be like 80 degrees. It might be like nice and toasty in some of those hot spots. So that's going to really speed up transpiration because that air, that warm air can hold more moisture and it's going to suck it out of your plants faster. Yeah, it's interesting to know that it's both the heat, it's the temperature of the air, and also the HVAC systems, because like the vents are literally pulling humidity out as it circulates air, but also the temperature, because just going back to my office, 
which PS, I mean, my audience knows this by now, but my house is so dry. It's like 12%. So getting to 35 is such a win for me. But also my office is very cold. Yeah. So it's 65 degrees at 40% humidity, which is different than in the summer when it's 90. It's like so hot because I don't have air conditioning in my office. It's so hot. Yeah, you're not using an HVAC system. So it depends on where you are. And this is something that I want to say because elevation affects BPD, vapor pressure deficit. The higher you go, pressure is lessened, vapor pressure deficit goes down. So you will lose less through transpiration at higher elevations. Say you live in a very naturally humid climate that you don't have to do a lot of heating and cooling in like San Francisco. You could have, say, indoor relative humidity of 60% pretty consistently without you doing a lot of heating or cooling in your space. And your plants can be really happy you know, year round. It may be cooler in your space because you're not heating it in the winter. So your watering needs will, will slow down. So you know, this is where I really always have to push back on general plant advice because general plant advice does not address everyone's unique location, latitude, altitude, home environment, light. And the other thing about running HVAC systems or heating units is that also what does air blowing across the surface of a leaf do as well? It also speeds up transpiration. It also speeds up evapotranspiration. So not only will warmer air... And if it's hot, dry air as well... It's going to dry, right? It's dry air. So it's going to suck it right out of your plants. That's going to give you crispy. That's going to give you crispy leaves. Yeah. So in the winter, you know, you may need to move your plants away from heater vents because it could just dry them out much more quickly than you even realize. Radiator death. I know I talk about radiator death, you know. Yeah. No, I just talked about this in a recent episode on like preparing, like caring for your houseplants in the winter. I 100% water my plants so much more in the winter than I do in the summer because of my freaking baseboard heaters and the fact that most of my plants are less than a foot above them because they're on plant stands, but they're not in the ceiling. And so in the last month, I've had to like ramp up my watering schedule with my plants because they're just drying out more. And that's the exact opposite of what blogs tell you about winter house plant care. Right. If your house is darker, which obviously many people have darker homes. If photo period gets shorter in the winter, um, ambient light can reduce by about half natural light, depending on, on your latitude and exposure. If you're not using grow lights, obviously you have a lot less light. What do we know what happens when you have a lot less light? Photosynthesis, transfer, everything slows down. So water usage for your plants will slow down. But if you crank up the heat in your house and you've got heaters running and air blowing across those plants, they're still going to dry out faster. And so if you're in San Francisco and you're not using a heater and you have relative humidity of 60 degrees and your room temp is, you know, 70 and you like it there, yeah, and light levels are lower, yeah, you may need to dial back on your watering because at colder temperatures, water is going to sit at the root zone longer because you don't have as high a rate of transpiration. The water's not moving up and out and you can overwater plants when there's less light at cooler temperatures, right? You got to dial it back. But if you're in a situation where you're having to really crank on heaters in the winter, your plants are going to dry out much faster in that warm air. Yeah, totally. It's fascinating. Is there anything else that we should know about in terms of other factors that are going to affect the humidity and our house plants besides our HVAC systems? Anything else that we haven't covered? I think we did a pretty good job. Well, I mean, I think it also depends on how leaky your house is, right? So newer airtight homes obviously are not going to let in as much outdoor humidity. But if you live in an older home that there's more airflow in and out, then yeah, you may end up with higher natural humidity levels in your home, which is good and bad. You know, it just again, it depends on where you are. And then of course, you know, I'm always going to throw you back to light right? Light is really the number one driver of your your plant growth and photosynthesis and all of those other things. So you do have to take account of the light that you're providing. And if you have a very dry winter house and, and some, yeah, like you said, 12%, I think that, I think it's much more dramatic than most people realize how dry, how low the relative humidity 
and thus vapor pressure deficit increase can be in the winter. Yeah, you can be at 10, 12%, which is not only terrible for your skin, um, but it's it's so bad for you. It's really bad for your, your plants. So just something to think about. Things can dry out on you in the winter really, really fast. I think it's so interesting that at least on my journey with humidity, I got hygrometers a couple of years ago. We've talked about them many times on the podcast. I've talked about them on my YouTube channel. I was fascinated with how drier my house was than I thought it was. But still, like I couldn't have a humidifier because of multiple reasons. I was in a log cabin, blah, blah, blah. So I didn't really alter the humidity. Then I got my bird. (laughs) And when Frankie started itching his cute little claws because his skin was so dry, I was like, okay, fine. It wasn't me. It wasn't me waking up like gasping in the middle of the night because my house was so dry. It wasn't my houseplants. I God love my houseplants, but it wasn't my houseplants that got me to finally kick over. But it was Frankie. And then I was like, okay, my office, which is Frankie's room is going to be the humidity haven. And I still have to get pull my humidifier out. But yeah, and now I, this is also where I've put all my high loving my moisture loving houseplants, which I just think is so funny. But okay, so let's talk about say you are someone who you, you get a hygrometer, you're like, holy shit, I'm at 20% humidity. This isn't good for me. This isn't good for my plants. And you want to increase your humidity in an effective way that increases your humidity over a long period of time and actually will positively affect your plants. What works? Let's start with the positive. What works? Not much. If we want to be honest about it, it's really difficult to meaningfully change the absolute and relative humidity in a space for any length of time. If you're running an HVAC system, you're always going to be fighting against your air conditioning or your heater because its job is to pull moisture out of the air. So the things that don't work, okay, that research shows don't really work to meaningfully change the humidity for your houseplants is misting them. So standing around with a mister around the plants, I call it a placebo effect. Oftentimes it it may not hurt. So if it makes you feel better to do it, you know, I'm not going to tell you not to, as long as you don't have great expectations of what it's going to do for your humidity divas. On top of that, moisture on the foliage can present problems. So when you're constantly misting and getting moisture on the foliage, especially at cooler temperatures, you can have problems with leaf diseases, fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, things like that. Not necessarily ideal, and it may really not help the plant meaningfully. One thing to remember is that a higher concentration of the stomata, the pores on leaves are usually on the undersides of the leaves versus the top of the leaf. So there's more stomata underneath than there are on top. And so misting a lot on top isn't always a great way to get water into the plant. It's not a great way to deliver fertilizer either. There's very specific situations in which you may want to do that with non-mobile nutrients. But for the most part, it's ineffectual. So you're not really going to change the relative humidity around your plant collection. Same thing with pebble trays. I know nobody wants to hear that, but again, I know they're pretty. And if you like them, that's fine. Again, it doesn't hurt anything. That's not getting any water onto the foliage. So if you like the look of pebble trays and you want to have them and it makes you feel better, then by all means, you know, put a pebble tray in there. It's not going to hurt anything, but it isn't going to meaningfully change the relative humidity or VPD in your space. Can I ask a question about the pebble trays? Yeah. Because the thought with the pebble trays is it's a pebble tray that you put your plants on and then you fill that tray up with water and the water evaporates and then it's supposed to create like a microclimate around the plants. That's kind of what people say. So why doesn't that work? Is it that the water will evaporate, but it'll go into the entire room or that it evaporates quickly and then it drops? Yeah. And then your HVAC system is just going to suck that moisture out. It's not just going to hang out around your plant and be absorbed by your plant, or it's not going to hang around your plant such that it's going to stop transpiration. Right. So, you know, then we get to things like humidifiers. Okay. So humidifiers can be slightly helpful. They aren't going to massively change the VPD in a space. Again, if you're running heaters or you're running AC, its full-time job is to pull that moisture out. So it can have a minimal effect, but to really make the most of humidifiers, 
they need to have a large capacity, a large volume capacity, hopefully on a timer. You're going to have to run them on a timer pretty much continuously off and on through a 24 hour period. And you really sort of need to group plants closer together, right, to have the benefit of adding a little bit of extra moisture around it. Ideally, grouping plants together on its own is a better strategy because transpiration does something else to the air temperature. It actually cools it. <laughs> so transpir right, you're putting moisture back into the air cools it, um, which kind of slows everything else down, which can slow the rate of transpiration. So when you group plants together, they sort of benefit from each other's transpiration. That can slightly increase the humidity level around that group of plants and slow down transpiration a little bit. So just grouping your tropicals together can help. The thing you have to be careful about humidifiers is that moisture can present problems for your home in terms of floors or carpets or walls. Anything adjacent that moisture building up on could cause rot or mold or mildew. So you also have to think about that. You have to be careful how you use them in your home just so that you aren't creating any mildew problems, right? Just in terms of the type of home you have or how close it is to a wall or, you know what I mean? So you have to kind of think about that too. So it can help a little bit. It can help a little bit. But I'll tell you, if you're really into humidity divas and you're struggling with all of those methods and they're still not totally working, especially in the winter or wherever, whenever it happens to be warmest in your home, you really are in a situation where you have to go under glass. You have to go undercover. You have to go into a terrarium, into a wardian case, into a glass cabinet, a grow tent, indoor greenhouse, right? You basically have to contain that, that air vapor to water vapor to slow down transpiration and hold a high enough relative humidity and a low enough vapor pressure deficit to keep those species happy. Yeah, I think that's why that Ikea grow house cabinet got so popular because I think as especially the pandemic, as people were in their peak, like rare plant collecting phase, getting some sort of large glass structure to grow under glass, I think is the answer for a lot of these, especially the really rare aeroids that just like need that extra TLC, like this Calathea that, you know, I'm realizing we're developing our relationship together right now. Yeah, yeah. So for individual specimens like that, and I don't know, you can let me know when you want to sort of talk about individual strategies or the different types of gear, because they're all very different. Yeah, why don't we start with what if I only have one plant and then we kind of grow into, should I put multiple plants under glass? So, well, first off, let's talk about growing under glass. Why is it great? I know that you're obsessed with growing under glass. It's your hobby. I've been into your house and I've seen your wall of amazing vintage glass plant domes and stuff that you have. Why does growing under glass work so well? Well, so obviously when you put a high humidity loving species under glass, you create the relative humidity and a low VPD that that plant needs to just be happy. It's not going to lose water all the time and it can have the right level of moisture at the root zone and in the air in order for it to thrive. I find that taking a humidity diva or tiny plants that really have high humidity needs and growing them under glass actually can turn them into some of your lowest maintenance plants. Because I will tell you, I hardly ever open or uncover any of my grown under glass specimens because you just don't have to add water very often, right? So they can go from being your most persnickety divas to like the plants that you can leave for months and never have to worry about, right? It's crazy. So how changing that relative humidity, keeping it constant and lowering that BPD all of a sudden, now the plant is, is living in what would be sort of its natural environment and doesn't need to be watered all the time right? And it, it can be happy and healthy. So yeah, an individual specimen, if you have an individual specimen, you can use things like close jars, bell jars, right? Big glass vases, and just set them over the plant, you know, make sure you've got something to absorb water underneath, because you're going to have evaporation condensation on that glass, it's going to recycle, and you don't want it to warp anything you have it under. So you need to put something under that glass, that's waterproof. And you just cover it. I you know, for small plants, you can use anything glass jars, canning jars, bases. You can thrift. This is a plan friends go watch. I made a YouTube video this month on alocasia and I share in that video, my wedding vase. I thrifted this insane. It was huge 
cloche system. I don't know what it would technically be called. It's like a vase that has a top on it. So it's not a cloche, but it's a cl- enclosed glass. Yeah. I mean, technically those are like cookie jars or cloche vases, right? They have a pedal, st- pedal st- and then you can either, if you do it correctly and you understand root oxygen and drainage, you, you could plant like an epiphytic species directly in that covered up, or you can just set the pot in. You just set the pot in and you cover it up. And that's like the easiest way to do, which is what I do with a lot of, a lot of specimens, a lot of potted specimens. You know, I just set them. I use glass jars and you know, like I'm obsessed with my mushroom. I have. Yes. Tell us more about, describe the mushroom for those listening. I probably have the biggest collection of vintage, and this is a tiny one. I have big ones of mushrooms. I'm obsessed. I have the the mushrooms and the eggs. I vintage shop for any glassware though, but I mean like canning jars, just basic. Here's a cool little oak leaf ivy that just grows, you know, just in a canning jar. But yeah, I'm obsessive. I have, I love seventies glassware. I am a child of the seventies. I love that stuff. And so, yeah, you can really just recycle or reuse anything. It just has to be big enough to cover that plant as it grows. When you get to the point where some of your anthuriums and things like that are getting bigger, right, then you have to go, it's hard to use smaller glassware, but you know, I love tiny plants a, a lot. I'm kind of obsessed with tiny plants. Wrote, you wrote a whole book on them. Yeah. Wrote, yeah. If you want to, I go into this, here's my book, Tiny Plants. I go into this whole methodology and how to, how to grow under glass in tiny plants. All of the same concepts that I describe in the book translate to bigger tools. So, so things like, yeah, you can use bell jars or cloches and just simply, you know, cover that plant. I do what I call burping every once in a while. I just burp it. I just do a little bit of air exchange in there. Open up the lid every once in a while. You may or may not need to add any moisture. So that can really, as long as those plants are getting enough light, that is a really easy way to take a plant that is really difficult to maintain and all of a sudden make it easy. You know, I have this little Maranta. This is a miniature Maranta. I can really not find it anywhere. I should propagate it and sell it. But it's a little tiny prayer plant. This is as big as its leaves get. Oh, it's so little and cute. Isn't it cute? And it's been in this yes. glass jar for years. I haven't opened it in months. And so, yeah, I mean, and you can do all sorts of cool things. Now, you know, then you get to things like Wardian cases. So Wardian cases are not terrariums, even though they get called that. And a Wardian case is, again, is a glass case, like a medicine cabinet. This is a classic Wardian case right? It's, it's got a base in it. Yeah. It's like a big rectangle. Yeah. Kind of iron. Yeah. Yeah. And the lid comes off and you set your plants inside and then it maintains the humidity. So it's not directly planted and it's not necessarily watertight. So basically anything that you're like putting it in your glass, Ikea cabinet is not mm-hmm. a terrarium. It's technically a Wardian case. A Wardian right? case. It's a glass case that you're enclosing plants in behind glass to provide high humidity levels. You've got things like orchidariums. So orchidariums are almost like a Wardian case too, where you can, I have a really cool high tech one that has recirculating water, has a little mister and a little fan in it that I grow all my micro orchids in because I'm a huge micro orchid fan. So those are very cool and it's got grow lights in it. So you can get really technical with all of these environments. Grow tents act the same way. So if you have a grow tent that you want to use artificial lighting in because maybe you just don't have a lot of light in your space. You can grow really nice collections of plants inside a grow tent and manage your humidity in that as well. And then, you know, you get into things like actually terrariums, which are planted, right? So then you have to think about your your drainage layers and things like that and plant into terrariums. Some high humidity plants don't necessarily like being planted in terrariums. Like you have to be really careful managing your moisture. They can get too wet. Like little African violets, for example, I often find are much happier just set inside a Wardian case or something like that versus planted in a very, very moist terrarium. So you, again, you have to get to know each species and kind of what moisture level they like at their root zone. Plants that are more epiphytic with very small root zones do really well in glass cases, set in glass jars, wording cases. And then you can get into terrarium building and repariums and enclosures that really you're planting in for high humidity species. And that's a whole nother topic. Yeah, I have a plant friend way back when this was an episode we did probably two a year ago, two years ago, um, how to have a large plant collection. Plant Mama, that's her account. She literally bought like a plastic greenhouse 
and she put it in her second bedroom. So she had a greenhouse in her second bedroom in her apartment and she had beneficial insects in it. Like it was this enclosed, it was the whole thing. She grew, she was like, yeah, I'm growing under, you know, glass. I think this was plastic, obviously, but I guess that's the most extreme version of literally putting a greenhouse in your second bedroom. It looks amazing. I would say grow tents are kind of, you know, have been in play for a long time like that. But yes, you can buy the little plastic greenhouses that are used essentially as what we call cold frames for out in the garden where you might get a jump start on ceilings that just need to be protected from the frost and you set in there a frame and they're just covered in plastic. You can actually set those inside your house and you can keep your, your you may have to still provide supplemental light inside that space depending on the location you have it in your home. So don't forget about that. But yeah, that can be an easy way. You can, um, a lot of propagation shelves also come with plastic covers that you can put over them. So those are a cool way to grow your collection of higher humidity species. I actually just did an interview for Architectural Digest uh, um, not too long ago on indoor greenhouses and all the different things that you can use. You know, they call them greenhouses, but you know they're basically an assortment of what we're talking about today. It's basically going under glass with high humidity specimens. And that allows you to, yeah, keep that relative humidity high, vapor pressure deficit low, <laughs> essentially, is what you're looking to do for the species. Yeah. Now, I feel like with the first option we were talking about, the cloches, the smaller, you know, one plant things, those I feel like are very readily available at your plant shops. I am obsessed. I mean, it's so funny. I was thrifting for a terrarium video that I made for YouTube. And there was a Goodwill next to a Michaels. And I went into the Michaels to be like, okay, if the Goodwill doesn't have anything, let me see what they have. They had a whole section of terrarium opportunities. But then I went into the Goodwill and I got everything in Michaels for $2. Like Goodwill is brimming with old glass stuff that people don't want anymore. So I feel like thrifting is amazing for that. I've never seen an Edwardian case at a thrift shop, though. Where would you recommend people look for Edwardian cases? Real Edwardian cases. I mean, obviously, you have real vintage ones. This one that I showed you, there are some glass makers out there that actually build mm -hmm. some of these. So you can look online, you can look on Etsy, you can look places like that yeah. and find small versions. If you ever go to the New York Botanical Garden Orchid Show in spring, which I'm mm -hmm. going to go, I'm going to go this year. They do a really lovely display of potted orchids with a vintage Victorian Edwardian case. You can really see what it looks like if you want to get a, a close up, but usually they're on a stand. They look like a miniature greenhouse. They have little doors that open or it slides on top and you're not planting directly into this. You're setting potted specimens inside of it. And so you kind of have to do estate sale shopping. You got to do that kind of level of yard sale. You got to get on eBay or whatever and look for those, you know, types of items. I mean, I've done some serious hard online digging for all of my eggs and mushrooms and um, 70s glassware, but it's all vintage shopping. It's all Goodwill. It's all junk shops. It's all, you know, Salvation Army. It's, it's all places like that. But yeah, if you're looking for a fancier real Edwardian case, you're either estate sailing, going online and looking for vintage, um, looking at some of the more modern glass making artisans who are making like the one that I showed you. Yeah. Or you're going, you know, like I have a vintage medicine cabinet, like a real vintage medicine cabinet, which is what the Ikea cabinets are fashioned after. They're just sort of a, a modern, um, you know, lower price point. So essentially you can do something like that. Like you can make your own sort of modern less expensive Edwardian case with with a glass cabinet from a furniture shop. Anything that you can keep that will handle the extra moisture, like a wood cabinet with glass would be tough because of the humidity that you're creating. So it really needs to be metal, preferably. But anything like that, you can make into a Edwardian case, essentially. Yeah, get creative, plant friends. And tag me and Leslie when you bring glass home and get creative with it. So for you, I mean, you're pretty much growing under glass with your high humidity species. Do you have humidifiers in your house or no? No, I, I really don't. I mean, when I don't feel good, I might run a humidifier, you know, for me, you know, next to my bathroom in my room. But no, I have, a, I have a pretty good sized house and I live in Texas. So we're hardcore running air conditioning units through the summer and it gets cold enough here that we run heaters in the winter. So with the size of, of my house and all the different rooms I have and all the different rooms I have plants in, it honestly would be really impossible for me to meaningly affect 
the relative humidity in my space. I have grow tents in my garage, which obviously stay much more humid for things that I, I'm growing in those spaces. But for all of my high humidity divas, I go under glass. And that is actually a big reason that I tend to grow a lot more rare high humidity small plants and tiny plants because they will fit in all sorts of recycled glassware. And I don't have to have huge cabinets, right? I can have little things wherever I want. And the cutie little things. Yeah, they don't make a mess. No water gets anywhere. They don't ruin furniture. I can move them around as my light exposure changes in different windows. I can move them to different rooms. I can set them on the dining room table when I want to have a pretty center piece and I can move them back. So it's really my personal way that I've adapted to being able to manage very low humidity in my house. But an unfortunate passion for a lot of really high humidity, rare plants and orchids, which simply cannot tolerate the normal low humidity in a house. So going under glass and using found recycled glassware is just my jam. And I have found it to be so rewarding. And it's a great way to maintain a really big collection of plants, even if you don't have a lot of space and you're battling low humidity. Now, for anyone who is tickled by this idea, what tell us about your book, Tiny Plants? Oh, yeah. So it just so happens that I go quite deeply into that topic. Tiny plants, I cover a lot of really unusual tiny species and groups of plants that you may not have ever seen before. So if you are looking to grow your collection, but you're kind of out of space with, with the big stuff, I teach you how to do that. I, I introduce you to a lot of tiny plants, and then I show you how I grow them under glass and, and maintenance techniques and sort of different categories. I, I talk about the different categories of cloche, Edwardian cases, terrariums, riparians. I, I teach you the difference between those and different tools that you can use and how to use an or orchidarium. So the tiny plants is really just sort of my passion project of me getting to dig into. It's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> All of the plants are so little. It's so cute. It's just my own little nerdy plant collecting <laughs> hobby put on display for the world to see really. <laughs> yeah. It's so awesome. Well, I hope that you continue coming back to hang out with me on this podcast. But also, I know you have other opportunities for people to hang out with you this winter and uh, spring. So what other opportunities can people come learn from you if you want to dive deeper and get even nerdier than today's episode? Yeah, if you really want to dig into the science to learn the why behind what the plants are doing and kind of get beyond the basic online blog level info, I have developed and teach two courses through UCLA Extension, and that's online. Anybody can join those classes. I teach indoor plants, care and maintenance, winter and spring. So that's coming up. I also teach botany only in spring, in the spring quarter every year. So if you really want to get into a little more plant science and plant ecology and how plants work, I teach botany. So you can join me in both of those classes there through UCLA Extension. And I've opened back up my online virtual consultations. So I do some virtual plant parties. If you have a group of friends that wants to get together and split the cost of an expert consultation, you can join me online and I kind of customize your time for you and your friends or family. So it's sort of a fun way to get expert plant advice with some people that you love to hang out with. Yeah, with plant friends. I could also see like local garden societies or, you know, local like plant swap meetups, like all those Facebook groups. I could totally see that being so fun to come like spend an hour with you on a Zoom and just ask you whatever questions you want. And I will also say I took that UCLA plants class and at this point, several years ago, and it blew my mind. And it's so in depth plant friends, like especially in the winter and the spring, like before, you know, gardening kicks up, it was so fun. There's homework, there's <laughs> quizzes, like it's learning about plant science at another level that I really enjoyed and would definitely recommend for anyone who wants to kind of dive into the deep end with Leslie in a way that we could never do on a podcast episode. <laughs> right, right. And know that it's open to UCLA students, people who are pursuing the HORT certificate and just general hobbyists. And you can choose sort of whether you want to take it as graded or not graded. So you can... Yes, like me. <laughs> yeah, you can decide for yourself how serious you want to get into all the materials or if you if you just want to make it easier on yourself. I know that that's a little scary sometimes, but there are options. So, yeah, I think I yeah. took it past fail. Right, you can do that too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my plant friend, you're the best. Thank you for this deep dive. I hope everybody learned something and everyone tries growing under glass, but I'm well overdue to get my humidifier going in my office. So this is also inspiring me 
to get, got to clean my humidifier out before I use it again for the season. And where can everyone find you on, uh, on socials? You can find me online at my website, lesliehallock.com. I'm relatively active on Instagram. That's Leslie Halleck is my handle there. Of course, I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, Halleck Horticultural. I do still have an active Facebook group called Plant Parenting. If you want to get in on that, um, that is a place you can tie me down every once in a while and get your plant questions answered online. So yeah, lots of places to find me. Thanks. Awesome. And until next time, thanks, Leslie. You're the best. Absolutely. And grow better. Thank you again to my dear friend, Leslie. She's the greatest. We're so lucky that she just keeps agreeing to come back on the podcast. (laughs) Whenever I have a plant science question, I'm like, instead of just texting you about this, can you just come on the podcast and do a whole episode on this with me? She's the best. So you should really go check out her offerings. I feel like that idea of a plant party would be so fun if you have like a local garden society or, or garden club, or if you have a local plant lovers group. That could be so fun to do. Even if you have a birthday coming up, you could do it for your birthday party and you can like hire her and you can buy an hour of her time and ask her everything you could ever want to know (laughs) about plants. So you can check out her website. It's linked in the show notes. Follow her on Instagram. Let me know if this episode was helpful and if you have any other ideas for episodes to come, whether they're with Leslie or not. My door is always open. You can find me at Maria at growingjoywithmaria.com or at growingjoywithmaria on socials. And I hope you have a beautifully planty week, my plant friend. Until next time, keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the plant parent personality test. It's free. It's super fun. It takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're going to get your plant parent personality profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.